Our next guest, you remember from movies like Go, The Hills Have Eyes, Replicate, uh, TV shows like Roswell, one of my favorites. Uh, he was on an episode of NCIS, The Fugitive with Tim Daly. Please welcome Desmond Askew to Mark 2.0. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. And be sure to My subscribe pleasure. so you can hear more podcasts and learn more from actors and musicians. I'm going to throw it over to Brian to start this thing yeah. out. So Desmond, great yeah. to great to have you. Thanks Thank for you. being here today. So um, uh, I've always had this like desire, this crazy desire to go to London since I was a little kid. It's just from my perspective, just so grand, you know, and and it's larger than life seeing it on TV from here. And is is that where you grew up? I did. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of London, but still part of London. I mean, it's just this sprawling city, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it was, I went to school there. So from 11 years old, I was taking the subway from the suburbs deep into the heart of the city. And yeah, you just don't appreciate it at the time, but uh, it, it is a fantastic place. My wife and I were last there just before the pandemic. Um, it's changed, but it's still the same. You know, it still has the same heart, the same character. It, you know, I'd be going past places that that wasn't there before. This doesn't look the same. But mm. then, you know, I go to an old theater and uh, and say like, oh, yeah, that was my dressing room when I was doing Les Miserables. Or, you know, I'd know my window of my dressing room. And That's was, awesome. You know, the first thing that really jumps out at me is that you were allowed at 11 to venture out way deep into London. And when I was a kid, I remember that I was allowed to go way out into the neighborhoods and stuff, but things really aren't like that anymore for me or my kids here, really. Is, is that about the same out there? I would guess so. But I, I would also say that in terms of uh, safety, I think the, the center of London, I feel safe. If, if my wife had to walk somewhere at night or something, mm -hmm. I feel safer in the center than I do in the suburbs because there is so much police presence. There's so many cameras. And, mm. uh, it, it really does fit. You know, you can be out late at night in London and, and myself personally, I feel very safe. I, I don't feel like there's uh, anything too nasty going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that about describes it for us too. So were your parents born also? Yes, both born in London. And uh, yeah, they, they got together very young. They had their, their first kid at uh, 21, I think they were. And I came along, you know, I was the fourth one. So I came along about nine years later. So um, you, you grew up in London, you're still in London? No, no, I'm in Los Angeles right now. Oh, wow. Wow. So you went to school in London? I did, yeah. Uh, how you went through, all the way through high school and college even? Maybe? Uh, well, no, I left school actually when I graduated at 16. So oh. my high school was uh, a private drama school. I was offered a place there. At the, we changed schools at 11. So our high school kind of begins at, at that time. And uh, at the time I was offered, uh, basically I'd been missing a lot of time from school uh, with, with doing commercials, doing TV shows. And, and so my principal was getting a little concerned and mentioned it <laughs> to my mom. And at the time there was a, a public uh, system whereby every child at 11 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, every child took uh, an exam called the 11 plus. And uh, if you were one of the top 2% uh, of the, the, the results, you were offered a place in, in a fantastic school. These, these were state run schools, but they were as good or better than the private schools of the time. And so in order to uh, placate my principal, my mom had me take the exam. I mean, it was voluntary, but uh, my mom said, you should take it and see if you're falling behind and how far you're falling behind. And uh, I actually passed the exam. And so I was offered this place in, in the, what were called grammar schools. And I really didn't want to go because as soon as I found out like this is serious education, uh, you know, you need to pick, book your dental appointments two weeks in advance and such. And, 
Mm. So I was I was really dubious about going there, even though I knew it was a fantastic opportunity. But at the same time, I was offered a place in this uh, a scholarship uh, to a private drama school. And I'd already decided uh, even a couple of years before that, that this is what I want to do with my life. And so I had these two amazing opportunities. Um, I couldn't, I mean, my heart at that age was saying, I just want to go to the local comprehensive school with my buddies. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to miss them. Uh, but uh, I did, my parents sat me down and said, look, you got these two fantastic opportunities that will define the rest of your life. You really shouldn't pass them both up. And so I decided I wanted to go to the drama school and spent five years there and graduated at 16. And then I got a TV show in England. So college never really entered the equation. I, I just, after that, I mean, I, I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be educated, but from that point on, it was just really reading books. <laughs> And, you know, it, it keeps coming up on our show. Whoever seems to end up in these high schools that are more, uh, you know, enter, I, I don't want to say entertainment, like uh, art, arts-based mm -hmm. schools, um, I would tell our viewers, if you can get into one of these schools, it is definitely a shot forward. Uh, how, how, how would you say people could get into there? What, what do you need? Uh, well, this and mine came about from uh, actually joining an agency. I was eight years old when my mom, my mom and dad were both working. And uh, my mom, I guess, had some level of guilt that they couldn't do the extracurricular things. You know, they, they were too busy working to take us to whatever, uh, karate or soccer or whatever it may have been. And so she saw an ad in the local paper that an, a children's agency was looking for boys of my age. They said there'd be modeling work or commercials or this kind of thing. And so I had joined the agency at eight years old and the owner of the agency had also set up this school around the same time. And I mean, it was tiny. It was in a, a, a 17th century church uh, that had wow. been somewhat converted and there were only 120 students. And so, I mean, as for being able to get in, my, my uh, door was kind of open to me. But, but I would say, you know, just do your research and, and work hard and, and try to be noticed as much as you can. Hmm. It, well, it didn't hurt having parents that were behind yeah. you. It sounded like your I parents were... Cheers as well. <laughs> cheers, cheers, please. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sounds like, and we find this a lot too, that we have like a great mom or dad really behind, you know, and it sounds like your parents are very hardworking and, you know, to, to, it's not easy to make a living. Mm -hmm. And they were good enough to say, okay, you like this, you know, and help you propel forward. In uh, that. My dad, actually, he used to work nights. Wow. So he would work during the night and then come home from work early in the morning, take us to school and then go mm. to bed while my mum went to work her job during the day. And then when she came home, he'd go out at night. And, and so it was that they, I really don't know how they even conceived that they would have the time to support myself and my younger brother also used to do it. But, uh, but my dad would literally sometimes come in from a, a 12 hour shift in work and take me to a commercial shoot or something and he'd be dozing off you know in the corner yeah. but yeah. that was that was their support for us and i think that really helps you know and yeah obviously when you're a child actor oh bless their heart you were lucky to have them that's awesome so so uh you you're you're in school and what did you what were the big takeaways you got from that that time the time at that school really that helped your career uh, I mean, I think just the, the, the basics of uh, uh, how to be a good member of the, the crew, the, the project, that there were things that, uh, you know, as far as the internal, the, the acting side of things, I think I kind of had a pretty good handle on it. I always like to play pretend games and things like that, but just knowing uh, why a director would want me to look this way or to raise or lower my voice or how your performance would be affected by, you know, a really tight camera angle or if, you, you know, that performance has to be big mm. if it's in the wide shot. Um, just just the, the, the technique, I guess, is what I learned. 
it's fascinating to me. I would I would never get sick of learning about that kind of stuff. It's just I love the entertainment stuff. In fact, <clears throat> now I want to kind of keep things in a timeline if I can. But my notes, I see you're in. Well, in my time, I remember Wham being a huge, huge. I mean, yeah. in my high school, exploded with uh, with that. And I see uh, the Wham video, Bad Boys, was it? That was the one, yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of want you to go into what you did after school, but go ahead. If I if I skipped over something good, fill it in. Uh, well, I mean, the the Wham thing is a, a fantastic story because my George Michael was uh, English of Greek parents, mm. and so in Greece they were so proud of his achievements, and rightly so. I mean, the guy was phenomenal. But when I met my wife. Uh, she, we were together probably almost two years before, and I knew she liked George Michael, but I didn't know how much he had meant to her because she's Greek. She grew up in Athens. And, I had no idea about his Greek heritage at all until just now. His name is uh, Georgios uh, Pana. I, I don't even know. I could call <laughs> her tell me that his date of birth. Wow, is wow, that's. But uh, yeah, so. <clears throat> we've been dating or I think maybe we were married yes we were married and and he came to LA to do a 25th anniversary concert of, of mm. the start of his career and I managed to get backstage passes and to introduce them and she still thinks it's the greatest day of her life but um, oh, wow yeah, yeah he was like probably I, I you couldn't get much bigger no he got not to at be all. like almost oh, nice. like madonna or something oh, yeah. that big you know he was he, he cast me in that video because he'd seen me in a commercial in the uk hmm. and the first thing he said i mean this band is just blowing up they're huge i had a teenage sister at the time uh, i mean my sister was a teenager at the time and she was a huge fan of them and the first thing <clears throat> excuse me uh first thing he came up to me and said, he's like, thank you for being here. He's like, we're, mm -hmm. we're, this video is, is the big one. He said, you know, we're, we're trying to, to, to make our names and you're more famous than us. And I was, you know, <laughs> this old boy. And, it, and I thought that was the sweetest thing of him to say. He's such a nice guy. That is awesome. Well, who, who's bigger than that? Maybe, I don't know, Paul McCartney, I think, maybe. That's yeah. the only person I can think of. Why don't you tell us about that? He had to chopsticks on the piano between scenes of his movie. Mm. So just to keep us entertained. Once again, another great guy that he, you know, while they're setting up shots and changing lighting and all the rest of it, he could have quite easily walked off set back to his big trailer. But no, he thought, I'll, I'll keep the kids engaged. <laughs> keep them entertained so i know how to play i don't play any instruments but i know how to play chopsticks thanks to mr mccartney <laughs> wow yeah. how did you end up on that that is amazing uh well i think that was actually my uh my younger brother probably got me that job they they wanted two brothers and linda mccartney paul's first wife uh, i think absolutely fell in love with my little brother at the audition mm. he was uh, he, I was the professional one, uh, but Nikki had bags of character. And so <laughs> he was just, I, I don't know, something, some <laughs> naughty thing happened and my brother couldn't stop giggling. And I, I'm kind of <laughs> a big professional dude. And uh, no, but he just, he, he really charmed Linda McCartney. And so mm. we ended up with that job. So those are basically your earliest jobs or? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, my yeah. first ever job was actually a, a photographic a billboard ad. Mm. And, uh, and this was when I discovered that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life because the, uh, the billboard yeah. was uh, mm. a period piece of a family crowding around their first black and white TV, uh, <laughs> awaiting the first ever broadcast. And they've got this big supper spread, sandwiches and cakes and uh, everything. <laughs> And I guess I was the kid who had snuck off and I'm tucking into one of the cakes. And mm. so all day I just had to eat cake and I had the photographer, you know, saying like, that's great, there's more of that, more of that. <laughs> I'm getting paid to eat cake and being told I'm very good at it. This is uh, <laughs> wow. for me. <laughs> so that's when you knew you wanted to be an actor. I think that that was the moment it first uh, planted the seed, yeah. 
So that's great. What about going, coming to LA? What brought you or brought, what brought you to the US? Did you go to LA first? I did, yeah. I, I'd never been to the US even for a visit, but mm -hmm. uh, my agent had a request for me to audition for the movie Go. Oh, yeah, and so I auditioned. I'd, I'd literally just come back. I, I'd been working away doing uh, provincial theater and came back to London and there was this script on my doormat and I opened it up uh, and yeah. it just looked fantastic. From Oh, uh, it really was a great movie. Yeah. This is the coolest script. Uh, and they said, we want you to audition on tape. Uh, so I would go, I mean, once again, my, my drama school were very, very, even though I'd left, at this point, actually, I was teaching there. Once I left, mm -hmm. I, I took a job as a teacher. And, uh, but the mm -hmm. agents at the school were fantastic and said, well, you know, we'll get a reader for you. We'll, we'll, you can go into one of the studios and take your audition. And, and I did, and the director, Doug Lyman, liked my audition, but had some notes for me. And so with the time difference, he's working during the day. So he'd be calling me kind of when he finished oh, work okay. at maybe 6 p.m. So it's uh, you know, 2 a.m. in England. Um, but I would wait up for the call and gave me some direction and said, can you send another tape? And so I did. And he was still interested, but not quite convinced. And so we kind of decided amongst us that maybe I should just get on a plane and come out there and you can direct me in person, as opposed to just kind of directing me on the phone that I make a new tape. There was no Zoom back then. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> so, smart. Uh, yeah, so, so we, I got on a plane and I came out and I met him and the producers. And uh, from there, uh, you know, I booked a job and then the casting director said, you should be here. You know, there, there's mm. work here for you. Um, you should think about moving. And so I didn't really have any ties at home. And so I sold my house and moved here the next spring. What year is this? This was that uh, we shot the movie in 98 and I moved here in 99. Mm. So I, I came out for pilot season because I thought, well, if I'm going to be moving out towards the end of 99, I better have a job. So. <laughs> I came out in the spring of 99 and did all the pilot auditions and, and booked a pilot. And so I thought, well, okay, now I can eat. <laughs> what was the first pilot that you booked? Uh, it was a show called Then Came You. It was on ABC. Mm. Uh, about a, It's like a, what they call a May to December, May December romance. So the, mm. There was an older woman and a younger guy, and I played the guy's best friend. It was oh. a scene. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did Roswell come right after that? Because I got to tell you, I, that's how I found you was from Roswell. I was a diehard fan. I had the T-shirt. I had the poster. You know, I was <laughs> all, had the all in on it. <laughs> the really yeah. passionate fans. Yeah. Well, talk about talk in detail about Roswell. Was it filmed at Paramount, was it? Uh, mostly, yeah. But we okay. did a lot of stuff on location as well out in uh, West Covina. Which oh, okay. Is maybe 30 miles uh, east of LA. Yeah, I lived in LA for 10 years. I know exactly oh. where it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, with that, that came along because uh, Fox, uh, actually, the show then came you was for ABC, but it was mm -hmm. made by Fox. So, we yeah. would shoot on the Fox lot here in London, West Side. And uh, they didn't know if the show was going to be a hit or how big it might be. And so I signed basically a backup deal that if this show didn't work and if it didn't go on to succeed, that I would still be contracted to Fox wow. uh, either way. And so when the show, the show lasted, you know, like half a season, they decided it's, a, you know, it's not really gaining any traction. And so they said, we're not going to do a second season. But we have this for you, Desmond. And so I went in and met with uh, Jason Katins and uh, we, we got along very well. I actually knew his writing partner through a, a, a personal contact. I'd met him through, a, he was like a friend of a friend now. Mm. And uh, so then, yeah, the, the role, I don't know if it was initially meant to be a recurring role. But uh, I did that first episode and then, you know, every, every couple of episodes they'd ask me back and it was a, a good time. Is it common to get a backup deal like you did or is this a special uh, case? 
I, I, I don't think it's common, but it's not necessarily uncommon. I, I think the development people at the studios are, if they see that maybe they don't have the perfect vehicle for someone, but they, they lack that actor. I mean, I've, I've heard of other people it happening, but yeah, it's not really common. I wouldn't say it's common. It's great. I, I'm still amazed at how like you're filming on a Fox lot for ABC. And I'm like, how do you guys keep all that straight and stuff? Well, I mean, that was the thing, even the, uh, even when we were filming at Paramount for Roswell, but it wasn't for a, a Paramount, it wasn't for a Vivendi network, you know, it, it was for Warner WB. Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. They, That's they, right, WB. Sometimes one particular uh, network, their studio may be a bit full or, you know, there, there's, Maybe another studio comes in and offers to do it at a better price than they could manage themselves. So, so they, they work together pretty well a lot of the time. I remember now that time, that's when the WB had a lot of new stuff flying out of oh, it yeah. on TV and it had yeah. really launched on TV in a major way. And now I remember that show being on uh, and um, I remember... I didn't watch it and I'm not sure why was it was it about like the other Roswell UFO things like that is that was that the main subject matter of that show uh well it was essentially that these the, the three lead kids were were aliens or were part alien mm. and, uh, they had these powers but they didn't know where they had come from they didn't kind of know their history and so the uh, yeah. history kind of caught up with them, was, was finding them. And so, and intermingled with some teen romance and teen angst. Uh, and it, I think it was a really good show. I mean, I it was. Now I actually remember watching some of them now that you've uh, freshened my memory. Yeah, that was a really good show. That ran for a while, didn't it? Three seasons, uh, wasn't it? Oh, wow. Three seasons, yeah. Wow, very but nice. it's on Hulu and Tubi. I mean, so it still has a huge cult following, you know. Yes, yeah. I think they they even did a remake recently, maybe they did, know, yeah. Years ago. I don't know how I really honestly I gotta confess, I really don't watch much TV, but uh but I was aware that they were doing a remake. I know some of the cast said it was a little too soon. I I'd seen Mahandra was saying on Instagram it was a little too soon to remake it. In her opinion. I can understand that. I mean, it, I feel the same way about, you know, they'll do a whole kind of series of, of Superman or Spider-Man or something. So, okay, now relax for 20 years before you bring this. Yeah. No, now we've got a new Superman two years later. Um, it's just, I don't know, I, I do think that people, that nostalgia needs time to build for people to, you know, after... Uh, Christopher Reeve was Superman. You know, it was a long time before another Superman came along. Um, it's a, I, I think that that makes people more kind of anticipatory, like really looking forward to this, rather than there is always a Superman movie either being made yeah. or in theaters or on TV. Uh, I, you know, I, I prefer a little more of a gap, so I like to miss something. <laughs> <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree. And you know what? I still remember, and I don't remember the other guys, the first time that Christopher Reeve picked up off of that ice and started <laughs> flying. And I was like, <gasps> yeah. I was just like, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, and you're right. They should not reset that again and again. You know, it just, it, it drives you. Know, and now there's that Spider-Man movie where they bring all those resets into some kind of multiverse thing. Well, they had to do something, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I've lost track of it now. I used to think back back in the day, I probably knew quite a lot about superheroes, but it's changed. Everything is moving so quickly now that I, I don't know the relationships. Now they all know each other. Yeah. So you, you would never see Batman in a Superman movie or vice versa. But <laughs> yeah, it's all Yeah, changed. I kind of quit now. watching all those. <laughs> I got lost and I said, ah, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure you, you said you're teaching, actually. I mean, how, how is that going? What's your setup? What do you, how do you well, do that? Well, not, not right now. I'm not teaching. I'm doing something completely different right now. But, uh, but yeah, when I left the school, uh, my acting school, I was, I did a TV show for four years. And then 
when that ended, you know, I, I kind of aged out of it because it was a high school drama. Mm. And uh, when it finished, you know, I'm kind of thinking, well, what's next? Um, and I would book uh, theatre jobs once or twice a year for maybe go away for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. But the rest of the year, there wasn't anything immediate for me. And so... Mm. The, prince, the school principal said to me, well, why don't you come here and teach for me? I think you could offer a lot to the current crop of kids. Um, one of my proudest moments was when uh, one of the kids I taught actually won a BAFTA, which is the, you know, the British version of the Oscars or the Golden Globes. I mean, because oh. they film and television. But uh, yeah, so oh, a kid, that is quite an achievement. How proud you must be. Well, I, I sat on the scholarship board as well for the, the incoming. She was, she's a fantastic woman, Sylvia Young, and she would uh, give away, uh, in my time it was only one, but I think it grew, but she would give away scholarships to kids who could not afford to pay for this school, but who she believed had talent. And so there would be, you know, a, a dancer on the board, there would be an actor on the board, there would be a singer on the board, and some of the staff of the school, uh, and we would watch these kids audition and say who we thought had the best shot to, you know, at, at a successful career. Mm. And I saw this kid, and he was maybe 12 years old or something, and I thought, he's fantastic, and I really, really pushed for him, and then by the time he was 16, he'd won a BAFTA. So I thought, well, I, my judgment is good, at least. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's so nice of you to be a mentor. I mean, it's you have such a great fun demeanor and, you know, you look like you'd be a really fun teacher. Yeah, those those days teaching the kid, we had so much fun. And, and the classes that would range from four year olds up to 18 year olds. Uh, I would just die of cuteness. I wouldn't be able to pay attention. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, oh my gosh, four-year-old actors! That would just be like. <laughs> Do you still have a mentor you turn to? Pardon me. Do you still have a mentor that you turn to? Uh, I'd say pretty much my wife. Her judgment is is spot on all the time. So I don't. Good think, answer. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, <laughs> she's the the love of my life. There she is up there. She's yeah. <laughs> She's always watching over me. <laughs> yes, she is. Hmm. Yeah. What about auditions? Did you have any auditions that stood out to you? So tell us an experience where you won a role and it was a really great audition. Uh, hmm. Well, I mean, I will say that the, uh, the, the Go audition was kind of bizarre in a way that uh, I had learned... You know, I think two or three scenes were the audition scenes. Um, <clears throat> so, as I say, after after sending two tapes, um, I always try to be off book for my audition. I don't want to be distracted with pages. And so I knew them very, very well. And I obviously went over them on the plane ride over. And, and then Doug Lyman just completely threw me for a loop when he said, OK, the sex scene is... Uh, I'd like you to do that. And there's no dialogue in it. It's literally simulating orgasm. And I, mm. <laughs> this was my, I, I'd been in LA, I'd been in America for less than a day. Yeah. And <clears throat> office in, oh boy. on the Sunset Strip with the Hollywood Hills showing through the window. And, uh, and that was what I had. And how do we welcome you? With a section. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Hollywood. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Uh, so, uh, Mark, I think you were going to ask more about the movie Go, right? Yeah. Tell us in detail what the movie Go was like, because it still has a cult following. And is that where you're most recognized from, or is it something uh, else? And the audition for this was really, a, is there more to that story? No, no, no. I mean, okay. I just did okay. my best. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, I think it was just Doug kind of uh, spitball. Like, okay, I can see he can play a scene. He can, mm -hmm. How embarrassed is he going to be in that yes. situation? Um, mm -hmm. That kind of thing. So, so it made sense for him to ask me to do it. But it was yeah. very bizarre after with jet lag. And like I say, this view of the Hollywood Hills right behind him and out of these huge windows. Uh, Mm. it's strange what are you most recognized for you figure uh 
probably either Go or Roswell. Mm, uh, yeah. Not, not the Hills Have Eyes. I actually had to wear makeup. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> People don't stop me in the street and say, are oh, you big brain? And I'm pretty glad about it. Replicate was a real fun movie too, but uh, do, is it that people haven't seen it or what? What do I you think, think? Probably, yeah, I think that's probably the case. Uh, that uh, and it's, I just think my character maybe was, although a lot of fun, less outstanding, shall we say? I mean, oh, I see really what you're saying. Regular yeah. guy stuff. He's he's drinking beer and he's chasing women and he's with Go. I think the. Uh, the the character himself was was very memorable no matter who had played him sure and then i think with roswell it's just that the fans are so passionate i mean that that's the one that is the the teenage shows teenage sci-fi uh and horror are just a different level of fans <laughs> they, they i mean they know everything about the actors they know everything about the characters there were people sending me fan fiction. Mm. Uh, they, they, um, very well written as well, but, you know, essentially short books, novellas about my character, a oh, where it may go. Or, and, I mean, it's incredible to be that deeply involved, but, but they really are passionate. And it, it's very heartening, you know, to get people that are... I mean, I had someone come up to me actually regarding Go, uh maybe i don't know five or ten years after it was released and he comes up uh, you know oh i love that movie and i thought you were great and so, but you gotta tell me something I said, why did you throw the gun out of the window it had your fingerprints <laughs> on it i'm like what well, it was in the screen oh, are you yeah. serious? oh wow <laughs> oh gosh the people oh they I don't know. Are, are they asking sarcastically sometimes? I don't know, you know. I, I honestly don't think this guy was. I think he honestly thought this is like my body screwing up. That's... Oh, my goodness. The Hills Have Eyes. That, that movie will stick with you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, that, that, that brings back some of that. I was like, uh, does that have still have a fan base? I bet you it does, huh? I think so. I mean, I don't really follow <clears throat> the, the <throat> kind of, uh, once I'm done with work, I kind of wash my hands or in yeah. that scrub uh, my body of makeup. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 but but I think so. I mean, I, once again, the horror fan. I went to a convention, uh, Fangoria, the horror magazine, had a convention in Chicago. Mm. Oh, boy. Um, I mean, the just so many people there yeah. and, and they're so passionate once again as i say the, the sci-fi and horror fans are just a different level oh sure yeah i bought so much star trek junk i swear to god well speaking of uh yes. speaking of next level uh fans we're gonna go into gamers now and you are the first person we've talked to who's been introduced or, or who's been involved rather in the in you know video game industry mm -hmm. which is surpassing everything yes. quickly so uh can you kind of start at the beginning on how you got started in that uh, well, I just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a friend of mine who worked at Disney said that I should be moving into the, the voice acting, uh, you know, that I, just, I used to do voiceovers back in England because the difference is it's such a smaller market out there that you kind of have to do everything. To use. I mean, Judy Dench was in a sitcom in England. Mm -hmm. she, this is an actress who doesn't need to be doing television. Mm -hmm. But this is just the way it works. You'll see the big, successful, and great actors in a commercial or on a, on a sitcom, or then they'll be in theaters in an Oscar-winning movie. But So I was used to kind of doing a little of everything, uh, and theater as well. And, and when I came here, it was more what was, how it was explained to me was that, you have your movie actors, you have your TV actors, you have your theater actors, you have your voiceover artists. Um, but like I say, after a few years of being here, my friend at Disney said, you really should move into voice acting as well. Um, 
So she got me a meeting with my voiceover agency who are absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, I just kind of got so lucky with them even representing me because they have some fantastic talent. But, but I went in there and they agreed to take me on and represent me. Um, and then it was the kind of beginning of what is now, everything is audition at home now. But back then, it was already happening, pre-pandemic, mm. pre-Zoom. So I bought myself a, you know, a microphone and a, an interface and started recording these auditions. More than anything else, I don't have that voice quality to be a kind of, you know, mm. like, cool. There's this, I, I'm not really a commercial voice, but the, my acting experience, they, they really responded to in the gaming world because there's, there's a lot of, intense scenes mm. you don't have the advantage of the you know the set and the the props and the costumes and even the other actors so you gotta kind of manufacture that just mm. in front of the microphone and so i think uh, i give a lot of credit to the video game industry that they they really were very focused on the quality of the acting as opposed to you know, whether it was a big name or whether something that would, uh, or a, a specific voice or something like that. They, they really did, you know, they, they, these would be, I still think now, I, I think some of the, the scripts for video games surpass movies nowadays. Mm. I mean, I, I think they're incredible, the detail that goes into them. And it is not linear. There's not a beginning, a middle and an end. It depends on the player. So you're recording every possible end, every possible uh, turn that this plot could take due to the player. In fact, like Halo just went backwards and went from a game into that uh, TV series realm, Halo. Oh, right, yes, exactly. That popular game, I'm like, oh, well, look, it's actually going the other way on this, which was, I don't know, which was actually very good. So, um, gosh, let's see. Bioshock 2, Resident Evil, Operation Raccoon City. What are all these? There's so many here. I, apparently, the computers can't get your voice right, can they? <laughs> <laughs> but there's no physical uh, actors, right? <clears throat> there's no one. Soon. They're, they'll except be for the guy with the tennis balls on him, right? <laughs> Everything will be CG. Oh, well, I've done that as well, yeah. That, oh, yeah? What was that like? <laughs> that <really> is, <laughs> um, you're just in a huge green room with, as you say, the, the ping pong balls all over your suit um, and, you know, eye lines for other actors. There's, there's almost no physical interaction in those things. And they're literally, it's just performance capture. Mm -hmm. And the other actors, they'll be added in with their performance later on. So it, it's, a, it's a whole different way of doing things to what I'm used to because I grew yeah. up in theatre. Oh, I was just going to yeah. ask you, have you gotten used to that? Is, is it bother you? Is it harder, easier sometimes? It's challenging in a different way. You know, I mean, the, there's, you, you have to work with people when you're on a set with just the camera. And this right. can be good. They're showing you drawings. Like, this is where you are. This is who you exactly. are. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But like I said, I mean, working with people, if you're working with good people. It can ah, be yeah, it'd be really exactly. great. If yeah. you're not, then you think, ah, I'd rather be doing this alone on a green. <laughs> so there, there, there are challenges to both, I think. So mm. you've done kid ones and you've done those ones that are like really, like really shocker ones, M for mature and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. What do you have any hobbies that you do in your free time when you're not busy? Uh, I would say, well, everyone who knows me would say cooking is the is the thing i'm kind of i've i've even moved into that recently where i've hosted some uh some global cookathon kind of thing where i will i'll show people i had one where i had people in uh, chicago new york hong kong even and we're all cooking the same meal at the same time and i'm showing them how to do it which is you know with the new technology this is fantastic it's it's something's a real passion of mine and to be able to share that is is fantastic. And it's still 
has elements of performance. I mean, I'm not a showman when I'm doing this because I'm literally just, I'm more like a painter than an actor because yeah. I want my meal to be perfect. So I'm probably not the best presenter for this, but <laughs> yeah. I always seem to like the food. So that's good. Yeah, I'm sure it's great content because you love it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, how many foodies are out there everywhere? Yeah, the older I get, I've found that uh, I, I tend to make all my decisions based on quality of life. Is How is this going to enhance my life? And, and this really does because the people are so happy that they managed to create this, you know, with, with some help, with some guidance from me, but they literally did it themselves. And to see that thrill in someone that they managed to, they, they, they don't cook at all, but by following me, they managed to put together this amazing meal for their family. And, and also a lot of the time that the people who I'm uh, cooking with are all connected in different ways. So this is like a reunion of sorts for them as well. Oh, it's great to see you use your success for such a beautiful thing. So um, let's say for instance, you got hit with this huge money bomb, right? And so you can do whatever you want now. You can make a movie even. You could do anything. What, what would you do? Uh, I think travel more than anything. I mean, I, I do love to get to different places and get to know different people. But, but that travel can be, you know, it may be to travel to, to learn a, a new flavor of cuisine. It may be to travel to make a movie of a script that I'm really passionate about. But, but I do like to, to, to get out and about and to experience the world. And, and I think, it's a, you know, it's an old cliche that travel broadens the mind. I yeah. mean, it really does. You, you tend to have more of an acceptance for people when you've when you've lived among them and that's why I, I always love doing movies that were abroad or in a different city or in a different rural area is because you don't when you're it's, it's different being a tourist to working in yeah. environment. <clears throat> and even though it's uh, you know can be short-lived I mean like when I went to Brazil I really feel like I have uh, an understanding of the Brazilian culture more so than if I traveled there as a tourist, but having worked with and among Brazilian people, you're kind of seeing them do their jobs, you know, as opposed to serve you. <clears throat> it's a very different vibe. Is there anyone you admire, like, like who, if you, you had all this money, you say, hey, I'm doing this huge project. I want you to work with me. Is there anyone like that out there? Uh, I mean, there are plenty of people um, in fields all across, but I mean, they're, they're still <laughs> there are some actors that when I see them, I, I just think like, how do you do that? I mean, I think uh, Judy Dench is is one of my favorites. I've, I've grown up with her. She's been there my entire life and she's never, ever not been brilliant. Mm. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, Americans, uh, well, I, I also really like Gary Oldman. I think the way he's able to transform <clears throat> himself yeah. with these different roles, because Gary Oldman to me is a very, a very unique actor in the sense that I look at his performances and I think, ah, he took it one step too far. He's a, mm -hmm. But I still believe him. And there, there's so many actors that just kind of ham it up and just take it that extra step too far and it's ruined their performance, <laughs> which, is, which is actually, they, they, they have talent. They're, they're, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with their talent. But, mm -hmm. but with him, he's, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody able to take a step or two beyond believable and still be believable. I totally agree. I mean, from Sid and Nancy, yeah. I watched that. I was just like, who is that guy who just pulled that off? And I mean, Sid Vicious, who's going to do that? Leon is, I mean, he's, his performance in that is, is just so, like, no actor would ever dare go there. Seriously. Seriously. And even we're talking about technology, even up to where he did A Christmas Carol. Did you see that? With Jim Carrey. Oh, in 
Oh, Matt, no. oh my gosh. He's Bob Cratchit. Ah. And for that movie, they, they, they kept their faces, the actors' faces. Mm -hmm. And it makes it, and you can see him acting. It's really, it's really a treat. But and even, you know. Yeah. Such a kind of eh, role. He's just the regular guy. And to be able to shine in these. And, and this is another one I really admire, actually, is Denzel Washington. Because oh, plays, of course. Yeah. In most movies, he plays the everyman. It does not matter. You you kind of look at those movies and think like, oh, he's a regular guy. And, but he gives this, like he, he portrays these really powerful emotions that once again are really believable in what would be, as I say, just an everyman. It, it, he's... It's perfectly how you describe him. You go into this movie saying it's about some guy, but he just comes out and you're like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. He just like, you didn't know how powerful the story was going in, you know, and he just, he just does it just all so well. Yeah, and, I mean, you can count probably on the fingers of one hand, the, the actors who can do that, who can take a role that, you know, I, I, I've read a lot of scripts in my life, obviously. And, you know, there are some who's like, Ah, with this role, what can you do to make it interesting without kind of showing off, without pulling focus away from the story and putting it on yourself and everything? And there are a handful of actors who can do that who mm -hmm. can just play those roles that don't jump off the page. I mean, as I say, when I did go, that role jumped off the page. I mean, it was a very <laughs> good script, but even particularly that role really jumped out. Uh, yeah. And I think that, you know, your, your Gary Oldman's, your Denzel Washington's, are, these are people who can, can make, excuse me. No yeah. problem. Uh, and these yeah. are people who can, who can make a, a, a very ordinary role extraordinary, I think. Well said, well said. Well, like uh, Harrison Ford. Yeah. Uh, no, that, another one. The Fugitive, yeah. right? Yes, uh, I, that guy. You you think? Uh, oh gosh, it's it's here here here's Mr. Star Wars comes in, <laughs> but no, he he kills it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, he's a, a movie star. He's a handsome, athletic action <laughs> guy, and everything. <laughs> he was subtle. I like his subtlety yeah. style. Exactly. That you you didn't think he had that in him because he's such an action guy. But yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Well, so you worked on the on the Fugitive. The, the TV original. show, yeah. Oh, the, the oh, yeah. TV show. Okay. Okay. What was that like? Uh, well, it was, it, that was a guest star. So I was probably only there mm. three to five days or something. And I believe it, 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 you're taking me back now. I believe you had a different accent too, no? Seattle. Yeah. I think that was. <laughs> yeah. I think you had an American <laughs> accent, no? Yeah. <laughs> You're good, Mark. How'd you remember that? Oh, Very no, it's good. available. You're... It's available, Desmond. You can watch it on YouTube. Oh, I don't oh that's know. awesome. I get depressed when I had him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Oh, man. So what are your goals right now? <clears throat> uh, to, as I say, I think just to, to enhance, uh, to, to everything I do, to think how, how can this make my life better for, for myself my wife we we tend to the first few years of our marriage we would uh we were both very ambitious and working very hard and and the last few years we've kind of gotten much more to is a, eh, do we really need the money for doing this it's going to keep us apart or I'm not really mad on the project or the, you know, or my wife's projects or whatever. So I'm not going to bother with this now. I don't, life's too short. I mean, we're, mm. you know, you get halfway through it and you really like, wow, it's halfway done already. Um, yeah. So now we tend to be a little bit more simple. I think that's what it sounds like you've got one of those great relationships everyone hopes to get. Uh, so you just, cel you just celebrated an anniversary, by yes, the way. Talk about years. that. 15 years. It was, uh, and it's flown by. But uh, what yeah, are her projects? I highly recommend if you to be happy in life, forget money, forget fame, just find your soulmate. That's <laughs> you'll be fine if you find your soulmate. And I know it's easier said than done, but. Yeah, when you do, it's 
it just makes everything so much easier to know that you're now part of a team. I mean, a, a real team that both have, that, that has a common goal and, and, and common uh, values. And so it's, I mean, that, that's the, the, that there 15 years ago was the greatest day of my life and I haven't looked back. I'm so happy for the both of you. Bless your hearts. Uh, well, anytime you guys have a project you want to promote or anything, let us know. Absolutely. We'd be happy to do a little video on it or just do a short on it or whatever you want to do. Well, We'd like to expand the, uh, the cooking thing, which uh, ah. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm deep into at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm keeping it very small and people we know and word of mouth. And we're doing no advertising at all, but... Uh, if that does grow, it will be, I, I will, you'll be the first to know. Great. Yeah. Come back that's on. What I love, that's what I want to hear. Great. Great. <laughs> well, you got any more questions for our guest, Mark? No. Hey, this was just a thrill, Desmond. Uh, oh, we are so delighted. It was wonderful. Yeah. We really appreciate you being here. Great. Well, um, everyone, uh, please listen to Desmond. He has a lot of great advice for you. Please share and subscribe. Hit the bell. And uh, thanks for being here. And thank you, Desmond. Thank you, And uh, Desmond. come back anytime you want. I yes, could do another it was hour. It an honor. I'm going to let you go. Easily. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much.